Hello there. Today we're having a look. Today we're having a look at an introduction to South African energy production. This is just a short video to introduce us to some of the main ideas and to introduce the terminology. Right, let's start off by having a look at the South African power grid. The grid is all the power stations and connecting power lines that covers the whole country. Now the main feature of the South African power grid is that in the northeast there is a cluster of very large power stations and then the power is distributed all over the country via these high voltage power lines and you've seen those I'm sure as you travel around there are high, high voltage power lines connecting everything together. Now for a whole lot of reasons the whole system is connected, connected together in one grid and we'll explain that in more detail later on. Down in the south here there is a whole set of power stations that because of this great distance they, they are there to supply power so there are the gas-fired power stations, the dark green the dark green ones and then there's here's the Kuburg nuclear station and all of these feed power into the grid and the grid is maintained in such a way that the whole country has to be connected to it for the system to work. Now we'll talk more about the details of that in particular the idea of load shedding later on we then have a number of hydroelectric power stations. Now the difference between a hydroelectric station and a coal or oil fired or gas fired power station is that they can be turned on pretty quickly. So while it might take half a day to get a coal fired power station going, the hydroelectric system can provide power in a few minutes from its turn on. So we have a number so we have a number of significant hydroelectric stations. There's one Kharip Dam and Van der Kloof Dam. And then this line coming in here, that comes from Kabora Bassa in Mozambique, which provides a significant amount of hydropower. Now these hydroelectric stations are used to supply power during peak time. So what we try and do is generate power from our coal-fired power stations to provide the base, the minimum amount, and then we use the hydropower to provide it during peak times. Now we don't have a lot of hydropower in South Africa because we are a water short country but there is still potential in this area here to produce more hydropower. We also have a system of what are called pump storage schemes where when demand is low water is pumped up the escarpment or up a mountain and then when demand is high that water runs down the mountain again to generate power. And the Angula, which is under construction in the Drakensberg scheme and the Palmeet scheme down here are examples of what are called pumped storage schemes of that nature. Then just coming on stream now is a number of alternate energy, so-called solar and wind power at Uppington and in that general region and um, in the northern part of the Western Cape and at Klipjewel here is an experimental wind farm all the way around the coast um, particularly in the southern and, and western Cape but all the way around the coast extending all the way up to Richards Bay there is good potential for wind power then something that hasn't been exploited at all yet but likely to will be in the future is that around the southwestern Cape that coast there is a very high um, is a very high wave potential. So big waves can be turned into electrical energy. So that's the overview of what the grid provides. Okay, having a look at our total energy consumption. Primary energy consumption refers to the source of that energy. So if we look at this pie chart, we can see that coal makes up a good 72% um, or 
or in fact more in some instances. If we look at this pie chart, we can see that coal is by far the dominant source of primary energy. Oil, of course, most of that is going into conversion to petrol to drive motor cars and buses and so on and trucks. And then natural gas, we saw those power stations along the southern Cape Coast. Nuclear, we have one nuclear station in the Western Cape. And then renewables refers to hydropower, wind power, and solar power. And as you can see, it's less than 1%. But that percentage is set to grow quite dramatically in the future. Okay, so let's have a look at how a thermal power station, thermal means heat, and a thermal power station is one that turns heat into electricity, and in this case, coal-fired. So when we look at a typical coal-fired power station, we know that it is coal-fired because these two huge chimneys are taking the gas produced, the waste gas produced away. These six towers here are called cooling towers. Now they take the steam that has been generated, and steam is a high pressure invisible gas, and they turn it back into liquid water. So inside these towers is like an artificial rainstorm. And the mist coming out the top, that's not steam coming out the top, steam is invisible. That's cloud or mist. And that is the water that is the water that is wasted. So the steam is introduced at the bottom here, rises up, cools, and condensed. There's a lattice inside here, a network of um, wooden and steel beams on which the water condenses, and then it all rains down and is recycled into the plant. So it doesn't um, capture anywhere near all the water that goes in, and this system is quite wasteful of water. The steam that is generated is generated in boilers housed in these six towers here and there's coal is introduced at the top and burnt to produce high pressure steam. And then this long low building here is the generation hall. Now the gener a generator consists of a steam turbine which is turned by high pressure steam and, and, and an electric generator. Now, if you move magnets near copper wire, um, then a current flows in the copper wire. So you have huge circular magnets turning inside a mass of copper coils. And these things are huge, um, 5 or 10 meters in diameter. And they spin at about 3,000 revolutions per minute. And they then produce electricity. And that electricity then of course, is transmitted out to the surrounding country via the power lines, which all connect up to form that national grid that we've just seen. If we look at it in a schematic, there it is, coal supply in at one end, coal supply in at one end and goes through the system. There's the boiler, produces steam, which goes through, drives the turbine, and the condenser, the condenser there is your cooling tower, and there are various ways of doing that, and it's recycled. But there is some water loss there, and of course there is ash that gets lost, and there is some pollution, quite a lot of pollution in fact, that escapes out the top. As a percentage, it doesn't seem very good. They will claim to get at least 90% of the ash, sometimes more, and gas out of that. But because they're burning so many millions of tons of coal, there's still hundreds of thousands of tons of ash that are escaping into the atmosphere. So this coal generating system not only produces carbon dioxide, which escapes into the atmosphere, but quite a lot of ash and also sulfur dioxide, which contributes to acid rain. In our other major generation system is nuclear and the first thing you notice about this this is the Kuburg nuclear station north of Cape Town and the first thing you notice about this is that there are no cooling towers anywhere that's because they're using ocean water for cooling and you can see that this is where the water is taken in they put 
these barriers here to make sure that this is calm and so there's no sand getting drawn in it goes into the system there and then it goes into cooling ponds over here because you don't want to put hot water back into the ocean although this water coming back in here is quite a lot warmer than the cold Benguela water over here and the interesting thing is on the side there even though it's a long way from the Indian Ocean the slightly warmer water has attracted Indian Ocean plants and animals then these two units here those are the nuclear generators inside those buildings which are called containment structures are the nuclear generators the nuclear units so let's have a look at what the nuclear unit looks like in a schematic here is your containment structure, your building. There it is there. And inside this are two things. First of all, the nuclear reactor vessel, which uses uranium to generate heat. Now, uranium, naturally through time, the uranium atoms break down. It's called nuclear, fu um, it's called nuclear fission when uranium atoms break up. And if you put a whole lot of uranium together, um, it accelerates the breakup process. And if you allow that to go uncontrolled, it will just get up, completely out of control, get hotter and hotter, and eventually melt everything. So they put carbon rods. Carbon is very good at absorbing the nuclear particles that generate that tree. The carbon is very good at absorbing the neutrons that fly around here which split the other atoms and so if you want to slow down the process you push the carbon rods in if you want to accelerate it you pull the carbon rods out point about that is you can control very accurately the amount of heat produced in the reactor vessel you then introduce water into the system and this is completely controlled there's no escape and that water just gets recycled and cooled it loses a lot of its heat in the boiler and it just keeps going around and around and so this way the radioactive water is completely contained and if there is a leak it's contained inside this vessel the superheated steam is then pushed through the turbine and the turbine turns the generator as we saw in the coal fired power station then over here we cool that water down so there's two notice there is this system here where you've got very hot water flowing around, superheated water. And then here you've got another closed system of water flowing around and a completely separate system of cooling ocean water. So three sealed systems, all of that designed to make sure that no radiation escapes into the atmosphere. And despite things like Chernobyl and the Japanese disaster, these are exceptionally safe systems and very, very little radiation. In fact, there's less radiation escaping out of here than there is out of a coal-fired power station. And then, of course, it joins in the grid and goes around the country. Then hydropower, I mentioned that the main hydro dams are at Kharip Dam on the Orange River. And here we see over here generator set the water runs down there through the generators and then is let out into the Orange River again this is an overflow spillway and in, in case of major floods this is where um, it will overflow into the river now as you can see the Kharip Dam while it's enormous it's not that high so it's not a particularly efficient generating dam and also this water is also used for irrigation by pumping water from there towards the Eastern Cape which you've seen in other units so only a small amount of hydro energy is available despite this very large structure but that's because hydro energy is not the only reason for this dam the van der Kloof dam which is downstream a bit um, is a more efficient dam the dam is higher and narrower and so it's able to produce a bit more power but the power station itself is um, smaller so these two don't produce a huge amount overall and 
Gabora Bassa in Mozambique, in fact, which is a very big dam on the Zambezi River, provides a lot more power. But even that, together, hydropower only provides 1% of South Africa's power. Right, let's have a look at the idea of pumped storage. Now this is quite an interesting concept because the power generated by a pumped storage scheme was originally generated by other power stations, particularly coal in the grid. But a coal-fired power station takes half a day to get going, whereas a hydropower station can be producing power in a few minutes. So what we do in a pumped storage scheme is when demand is low, which is in the middle of the night, we pump water, in this case from the Tugela River, we pump water, in this case from the Tugela River, we pump water, in this case, from the Tugela River, We pump water from the Tugela River up to the Dreekloof Dam. Now notice here, this looks like one dam, but it's actually two. There is a wall there between them. And the Sterkfontein Dam is a very large dam, and the Dreekloof Dam and the Dreekloof Dam here is quite a small dam. But this dam is enough to take 12 hours worth of pumping up the escarpment and then when they need power they can run it down through the turbines again. So notice here it says turbines and generators. So, uh, well sorry, no, notice here turbines and generators there are also pumps. So the pumps, the turbine is actually a reversible so it's either a turbine or a pump. So during the, the night they pump water up, during the day they run the water down. So during the night they're using power to pump it up and so now you've stored the energy up on top of the mountain and then during the day when you need it you let it run down and it generates electricity. Now all these other dams are dams on the Tugela River which deliver water into the Kilburn Dam here. So you'll see that water goes up and down. If we look at the actual dams and we look from the top here so over here is where we look at it, this view, down over these dams. So down here we've got the Kilburn Dam, and then down there is the Woodstock and the Spian, Spian Corp Dam. Now you'll notice here, is this dam is nearly empty. That's because most of the water in it has been pumped up to the top. So during the night it was pumped up, and now this is taken mid-morning, the water will now be allowed to run down again and fill up this dam. So it can go up and down the mountain several times. Here is the two dams at the top. The brown dam is the Dreekloof Dam. You can see that that water is full of clay and silt and it comes up to this dam. Now notice here again you see there is a muddy bank. So some of the water has run down again and exposed that bank. Now this is not a good idea in terms of wildlife because as this goes up and down all the time and it goes up ev up and down every day, it means that no ecosystem can establish there. So these are not very good dams from that point of view, that you don't get a lot of wildlife, bird life and reeds and so on developing around the dam. Whereas the blue water here, the clay and so on has settled out in these other two dams and then this is the water that's been allowed to flow over here. That's here, the Sterkfontein Dam. So the water either goes down again to generate power, or if they need water in Gauteng, they pump it over into the Sterkfontein Dam, and then it runs away down the Vaal River to Gauteng. So this is a very good system, because not only does it generate power, now there's also a pump storage scheme at Ngula, just north of that, and another one in the Western Cape at Palmeet. Now this is a picture of the Madupi power station under construction and it's due to be completed or um, start coming online in 2015. Now what's different about this power station, you'll recognize 
What's different about this power station, you recognize the smokestacks for the burning of coal. These are your boiler towers under construction. You can see there, there is a boiler. No, that's a coal hopper which feeds into the boiler which is down there. Um, but instead of the cooling tower, you've got this system here. Now that looks like a giant car radiator. Now just to put this into perspective, these towers are about 300 meters high. These are motor cars and trucks down here. This is enormous. So imagine a very, very large car radiator. So instead of the cooling towers, and Madhup is in the northwest province, um, you are cooling the water down by radiation. So the whole system is sealed and it uses much less water than the water powered, the water cooled stations that we saw on the Mpumalanga High Felt in the previous slides because there is no escape of water from the cooling towers. Now this is, works otherwise exactly the same way but the water system is in completely sealed and there is very little water waste from the system. Okay, looking at alternate energy sources, one of the most amazing things about South Africa, if you think of the Sahara Desert, and it is a huge desert, by far the biggest desert in the world, covering almost all of North Africa, and you would think this would be the most solar, you would think that this would be the place with the most solar power potential in the world. These pink areas are the areas with the most solar potential, and look at this. South Africa and Namibia have much better solar potential than the Sahara Desert. Obviously the Sahara has got all these areas where the solar potential is high, but in terms of peak solar potential, and look where it is. It's right in the middle, middle of the desert. There's, there's industry along the coast here. The, the industries are miles away from this area here. Whereas in South Africa, you've got solar potential very close to the Western Cape, not that far at all from Gauteng and Durban and the other places. So we have this huge potential for solar power. And the only reason we haven't used it is because coal has been so cheap. But because the electricity is getting more and more expensive and the price of coal is going up, the value of the solar potential here is going to be fantastic in the future. And so that's one of the alternate energy sources that South Africa can tap into. The other ones being wind and wave power. This is a solar farm um, near Uppington in the Northern Cape. And you can see that these are very big areas. All these black things here are solar panels, just as exactly as you might see on the roof of a house. And these are photovoltaics, not heating water. Um, the other way of generating heat from, so, sorry, the other way of generating electricity from solar power, if you're not using photovoltaics where it converts the light directly to electricity, um, is to heat water or even, in fact, they use sodium, they melt sodium, and they do that by concentrating the sunlight. You have a tower and you direct a whole lot of mirrors and they concentrate the sunlight onto that tower and they melt sodium which melts at about 700 degrees Celsius and the advantage of that is that that sodium will stay very hot for many hours and you can then boil water and turn a steam turbine with it so that you can use solar power in the night whereas this kind of photovoltaic system you can only get the power during the day when the sun is up. But there are a number of these um, these are called solar power farms. There are a number of those around the country. Here is the wind power potential in South Africa. And as you can see, the wind power potential is mainly around the coast. Average winds of greater than 4 meters per second, the ideal being about 15 meters per second. And that kind of potential is particularly in the Southern Cape. And then in the mountains, also there is potential. This line of high potential here is along the Drakensberg escarpment between KwaZulu-Natal, the Free State, and Pumalanga and Gauteng. So in the future, if you travel along the N3 from between Gauteng and Durban, you are sure to see 
wind farms in the mountains here and there are a number of wind farms in this area down here. This is the experimental wind farm at Kleinhevel in the Western Cape. Then there is wave potential. Now I haven't now South Africa hasn't developed any wave power generators yet, but we have very good wave potential around the southern Cape Coast because of those high winds in the those high winds in the middle latitudes um, produce big waves around that southern Cape Coast. So there is a lot of potential there. Not a huge amount, but in the future as we move to towards renewable energy away from the coal-fired energy which is producing a lot of carbon dioxide and contributing to climate change, we are going to have to look more at all the alternatives, including wave.